I'm Steve. I'm Max. How are we doing? Good, thank you. Good, good. Okay, well, we're going to rev you up a little bit and get you doing a few bits and pieces uh, this afternoon. But just a quick show of hands, if you would. Who in the room represents an OEM? Just one or two people. Okay, who <coughs> represents a dealer? A few dealers in the room. Okay, who would say they come from an aftermarket supplier or firm of some description? people there as well. And what about somebody from the repair sector or independent? Oh, we've got a few independents. Fantastic. Good. Okay. Well, we're going to talk to you a little bit about some of the evolving behaviours uh, across the automotive sector. Uh, but just to get started, one of the things that's clearly... Who's got a smartphone on them? Okay. Smartphones at the ready. We always start our little sessions with a selfie, don't we, Matt? Yeah. Probably, we are the new Anton Deck, by the way. Which one's Kick that drink out here. here. Yeah, right, here we go. Right, we need you all to wave and smile like you're really happy to be here. I'm going to start with a little selfie. I'll put it on the right way. Here we go. Okay, that was amazing. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's, uh, Matt, where are we going first? Tell you a little bit about ourselves. So, this is Matt. He's the one on the right as you look at it. Matt has been in the motor industry for nearly 10 years. Yes, he started when he was 12, and uh, he followed in the family footsteps, which he'll tell you a little bit more about later. But more than that, Matt has had experience in both, uh, well, in after sales and in sales, was a top salesperson in a franchise dealer, uh, part of a big dealer group for some time, and has recently emerged over the last few months to actually be my mentor, my boss, and also the person that I consider to be the first role model that I've had in a very, very long time. Uh, and this is Steve. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve has worked in the industry for 35 years, uh, has been my idol, my inspiration growing up. Uh, I'd like to pinpoint the moment when I was about 12 years old and growing up through, through secondary school, there was a nice Audi or Volkswagen outside the house every six months due to the manufacturer career that Steve had. Steve's worked on his own for 10 years, uh, and uh, recently we joined forces last year working in training and development in the automotive sector. Okay, brilliant. And uh, what we're going to be talking to you about today is about how behaviours uh, are evolving and have evolved as well. And um, just to give you a little bit of an insight to that, that's what we did look like when we first started in the industry. And this is what, clearly what we look like a bit now. So as you can see, the cars have changed. The hair has changed, the weight has changed, and that's just him. <laughs> so, yes, things have moved, and the point for us really is about, one of the things that Steve touched on earlier, and if you were in here for Carl's presentation a little bit before as well, um, you know, it's about thinking about, are our behaviours actually keeping step with the changes in technology? If I go back to when I first started in the motor industry, a smartphone was never even dreamt of, they were only just putting the space shuttle into the sky, and I think some of that technology uh, is now, actually there's more technology on some of the cars that, uh, that we have these days than there actually was on that uh, space shuttle at the time. So things have moved on a pace. Technology has and is moving at an enormous rate. My question to you, and I'm sorry if this is a bit controversial, but my question for you to think about and take back to your messages, uh, to your businesses, is, are our behaviours and our attitudes and our beliefs and values moving at the same rate? Are they changing and evolving at the same rate as the technology that we're having to keep up with? So as Steve talked about this morning, he used the phrase gifted amateur, and I like to think that that pretty much described me. In fact, if I was putting a CV together, I might put that at the top of it now, because I have to say that totally resonated with me as well at the time. So, um, with that in mind, Henry Ford is quite often held in high esteem as having been the person who pioneered the automotive industry. We're not going to get into who started and made the first car. We know all the stuff about where Henry Ford was. And we tap into a number of his little quotes occasionally, and we love that one, 
which is that if people at the time had asked him, or if he'd asked them what that they actually wanted uh, from him, he, they would have pretty much said, faster horses. And uh, he took that to mean a way that he needs to you know, pioneer and be a, a groundbreaking influence and start the automotive industry that we are now all a part of. For those of you that work within or ha around the franchise dealer network, will know that that's pretty much geared up towards uh, mass production. And when you have mass production, that has to then chunk down into targets and objectives, and that then can drive a whole set of behaviors that all of us and the rest of us, whether you're in consultancy or aftermarket or independence or whatever, um, we're all a part of sort of being on the receiving end of some of those behaviors. So what we'd now like to do is look at what we know about today's employees and customers. These are trends that we can see, that we can recognize in our businesses, in our personal lives, and actually us as customers. So first of all, we'd like to point out, we're less attentive. Would you say that about your stock workforce? Slightly less attentive? You've got a nod over there. What would you say makes us less attentive from previous years? Uh, use of smartphones, use of electronic devices. <coughs> yeah, so the rate of technology that's coming through is making the human element less attentive. Yeah, completely agree. So then would you say that we're more informed, touching on the smartphone element, would you say that our workforce is more informed? Would you say us as customers are more informed? That so we have, sorry? Certainly customers are more informed. They certainly have access to lots more information more easily. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, how, how many of you Google it? Put your hands up if you Google it. Steve, what did you do 20 years ago if you had some, someone asked you a question in the workplace? What would you have done? You would ask somebody or can refer to local paper or yellow pages, if you only remember that. Exactly. We would rely on, on the human element a lot more in, in previous times. Now we have access to information at the, at the touch of fingertips, don't we? So then would you say that we're less loyal? Because we've got access to all this information, because we've got access to so much technology around us and so much change in technology, would you therefore mean as customers and employees, we're less loyal? Do you agree with that? Yes and no. Yeah? What would you say the no element to less loyal? Because if your business is where they want it to be and it works for them, they will continue using it if the service delivered is adequate or good. Exactly. So you would say if the rate of change is there and, the, and their purpose is there, that they would remain loyal. If you would say potentially that their technology, the, the access to the information that they have and the ability to move forward as maybe their colleagues would, is maybe not so much, that they would be less loyal. They would be left behind or move on. Maybe? Yeah. So then would you say we're more connected? Completely. We're more connected. But what do we mean more connected? Do we mean that we're more connected where we could send a text to someone, we could send a WhatsApp to someone, we could send a LinkedIn message to someone? How many of you have reached out to someone on LinkedIn that you want to deal with on a, on a business level? Yeah? So you'd say that makes us more connected, as opposed to the old gatekeeper reference of, a, of a bringing the receptionist, trying to find who, who is the head of, in our instance, the head of training or the head of HR. We now are more connected. We can find out who that person is. We can find out where they work. We can find out where they're based. All at the touch of a fingertip. So then, that makes us less patient. If we want to find out where someone is, what someone does, or as a customer, where we can get something, where we can buy something, where we can access something, surely that makes us less patient. It makes us want something now. But at the rate of change that we're experiencing at the moment, that is that's multiplied in Steve's 20 years and my 10 years, I've seen the rate of change multiply exponentially because of all of those factors there. We are less patient, we can move on and move quicker. But as an industry, are we? Are we using what our customers are using in other industries, in other sectors, as fast as we can use in the automotive sector? Steve, your thoughts? I think, and even looking around the room today, um, we had a debate ourselves. Do we turn up for an event like this in shirt and tie? Because when I first started in the industry, that was the way that anyone who did what we do, that's what we wear, that's what we dress in in the morning. Well, who said? Because one of the most influential things that this guy said to me 10 years ago as a 15-year-old was, Dad, why do you work like that? 
why do you do things like that? And I went, at first thought, the cheeky little sod. And then I thought, he's got a point. He's got a point. The bit that I could very easily do was go, because that's the way it's always been done. That's the way I learnt it, and that's the way it will continue to be done. But actually, I stopped for a minute and thought, no, actually, what we should be doing is listening to people in that age group. <clears throat> Clearly, we are father and son. I think that makes us fairly unique in terms of what we're doing and out in the industry and working with manufacturers and so on. Um, and our mission is to hope that in, the, in some way they are going to start listening to the fact that, you know, we are being quite brave and saying, here's the leader of the future. And all of that stuff that Matt's just talked about, <laughs> no, you're smart. all the stuff that Matt's just talked about is evident now. So think about how our customers actually behave. So, I think you were going to yeah. talk So let's that. look at some trends. Think of how behavior links to trends. So in 2003, on average, how many visits to a retail site, so this is a customer, this is in a customer, put yourself in a customer's shoes, Surely you've all bought cars since 2003 or been involved in that journey at some point in your family. How many visits do you think that we made to a retail site before purchasing a vehicle, on average? 5.4, I've heard. Any others, any takers, higher, lower? Higher. Higher, how many do you think? Eight. Eight? Yeah? Eight. What do you reckon now? So, 16 years later, times have changed. We we'll think of those points I said before. You said one. Any one. other takers? Three. Three? I think one. Yeah? So, bear in mind, this is just an average. One and a half. So, that, what, what do you take from that? Customers are visiting a dealership on average one and a half times before making, making a decision. I don't know about you, but I can't quantify a half visit unless that's when you pull in, you can't see there's any parking and you drive off, because that's normally what we see in a deep retail site, yeah? Got some nods there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on to online research. In 2003, how many people do you think, well, on average as a percentage, did online research before purchasing a vehicle? Number close to not many. You number close to not many, <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. Should we say 1%, yeah, yeah. on average? Would you agree with that as customers yourselves? Would you agree that in 2003 you wouldn't have really looked online for a new car? You wouldn't have even wouldn't have really considered seeing different different dealers, look considering different franchises for the same manufacturer? No. What do you reckon it is now? 90 plus. 90 plus. 80 plus. Any others on 90 plus? Yeah. 92%. Now, without being a cynic, I reckon the 8% is the slightly older population that would still like to visit a dealership. I'm, I'm, I class myself in a slightly different category. I would still like to visit a dealership because I like that customer service element. But taking the customer service element out of, out of the picture, how many of us look at different ways of purchasing online? So how many of us look at the different methods, say, for instance, car wrap, that we consider that now? Or we consider looking at the manufacturer's website or the franchise website to look at used vehicles? How many of us use Autotrader to do our research on price of vehicles? That's all up there. So then if we look at willingness to buy cars online. So this is someone actually in 2003 saying, yes, I would buy a car online. So I'd buy a car without seeing it, without speaking to someone, 0%, okay? It's not, not far off that, it's less than 1%. I'd like to meet the people back in 2003 that said they would have bought a car online and trusted it from end to end in an experience. What about now? 60, 50, 60, 60. Got 50, 60. Any other takers? What about yourselves? Put your hands up if you would willingly buy a car online because of the research that you're able to do and the ability of knowing and trusting it's, it's new or used. Brand new. Yeah. It's oh, brand new, you can't go wrong, but used could be risky, so yeah. 65%. Okay. Not far off, 42%. Now that is taken into a fact of used vehicle, because used vehicles we can trust. There are so many uh, reputable dealers on Autotrader or any used car uh, purchase avenue. If you buy a car off uh, BCA, for instance, even us buying vehicles online in our own retail environments. But the willingness is 42%.
But if you consider that rate of change there, what are we going to expect in the next 10 years? I'll just leave that question. And for the purposes of what we're talking about, a lot of this is rhetorical, and we're not just aiming this at franchise dealers. This is about everyone who's connected in the automotive sector in some way, because what we're really kind of emphasizing here is how behaviors are changing, how we've noticed that behaviors are changing very, very quickly. We notice that in the learning environment in terms of the way we deliver training and what we do. You know, it is now for us no longer acceptable for us to turn up with a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides and run a day standing at the front. And uh, we're going to show you what we mean in a bit because we're going to get you involved in, in a little something. But before we do that, let's look at how we think uh, the customer's expectations uh, have changed. And based on the evidence that Matt's just put up there, we're told about baby boomers. Baby boomers are those who were born between the war years and the mid-60s. If you were born between the war years and the mid-60s, please stand up. If you can. If you, can. <laughs> if you were born between the war years and 1965, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, please take a look around. You see how many people that is. Generation, you can sit down now, it's okay, sorry. <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Did you sit down and go, ooh, I've started doing that now later. Okay, Generation X is the next generation, and they are the people that were born between 65 and 85. If you were born between 1965 and 1985, please stand up. Someone was casting aspersions on how accurate this might be. Uh, it's bad light. It's bad light on the other back. It really is. Okay. So there we have Generation X. Please take a seat. And then we have in there as well is probably uh, Generation Y actually, which is the those that were born from sort of eighty five to two thousand. So is there anyone in the room from eighty five to two thousand? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I won't ask you to stand yeah. up. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. She put her hand on the floor. If anyone asks, I am standing up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then we come on to the next little bunch of people, which are these guys over here, Generation Z, or in other words, who, who knows the common phrase for these guys? Yeah. Millennials. You all said that with a groan. You all went, oh, <laughs> millennials. God, yeah, these are these snivelling little sh sort of guys and girls that come into the business and we employ them because as a teenager, of course, you employ a teenager while they still know everything. <laughs> You've got one. <laughs> or have one. I've had one, yeah. I'd, I'd, like, go on. I'd like to pick up on that with the groan of millennials. Can anyone pick on, if I'd like to just pick up on that, why, why do we groan when we say millennials? They have got great communication skills, don't they? Great communication skills? <laughs> no? Lack of common sense. There's what, sir? Lack of common sense. Lack of common sense? Think about common sense. What's going on? They're a lot younger than you. Yeah. <laughs> They've got better IT skills than us. Better IT skills? Funnily enough, IT has completely changed in the school system now. They do coding, let alone ICT, which it was. In my day, and probably an abstracting. Yeah, all right, all right. Okay. <laughs> Get the point. <laughs> but we, we groan when we say millennials, but they're actually Generation Z, which is the same as Generation Y were, and the, the same as Generation X were, and the same as baby boomers were. Surely all of them brought in new ways of doing things. They brought in new methods, new technology, new processes. But lately, I know. I, say this may be controversially, but we blame millennials for the rate of change that we're experiencing. We blame millennials for changing the way we do things. Yes, maybe I agree they're bad communicators. Yes, maybe I agree that they're younger than us. Yes, maybe I agree that some of the processes or store their, their work ethic is different. But is it different because that's what our customers are experiencing? It's not their fault. They've got to go through it. They can't be blamed. They are moving as times do. But in our automotive sector, are we moving as times do? I don't think we are. I just, I just want to point out in this room, we, don't, we have three millennials in this room. So are we moving, are we bringing forward that next, those next baby boomers? 
Steve, you said that with the next generation is going to be the smallest amount since the war of people coming into the workforce. Are we going to embrace them into the workforce, or are we going to kind of put them aside because we've got other priorities, we've got other things going on? But are they our future leaders? Are they going to be the business leaders in a different way, dealing with different, different customers in the next 10 to 20 years? So we've got a problem, because we've got 60 people in this room, and only three that represent that final age group. So we've got a problem, Steve's got a problem, Every single one of you that runs a business has got a problem. Why? Because these guys are out there in the workforce now. And if they're out there in the workforce already, because this is people who were born in 2000 onwards, so we have 18 and 19 year olds out there in the workforce now. And I'll refer to a little video I saw on LinkedIn. How many of you are on LinkedIn, by the way? I'd like you, okay. Please feel free to join us, we love all that stuff. <laughs> uh, we saw a little video on LinkedIn a few weeks ago. And it was from somebody who was a uh, fairly prolific consultant in the industry. And he made a bit of a statement. And he said, when we employ a millennial, we need to tell them how to adapt to work with us. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. <laughs> That's the problem. You're not mic'd up, but I'm sure people got the gist there of what There is a 56-year-old man saying, we need to teach an 18, 19-year-old how to work with us. I won't repeat what you said, but it rhymes with horror. I've got two of them at home, and I know it. Absolutely right. And that, thank you, because we're on the same page. That's where my journey started as well. And why 10 years ago, when I've got, because I've got an older brother as well, and why I've got a pair of them saying, Dad, why do you do things like that? Why do you work in that way? I could easily have gone, well, that's just the way I do it. That's the way it is. It's the way I was brought up. 35 years ago, when I first started in car sales, that was the way I was taught to do it. So therefore, Actually, I've not built my career 30, over 35 years. I've done it for one year, 35 times. It's very really dangerous to generalize about just They're arbitrary things, aren't they? We, we <coughs> just get the nature didn't put them into a generation. Absolutely. We, we them yeah, exactly. That's like saying everybody over, <coughs> over a certain age is, is automatically a, a, a lever in yeah. the, in the, uh, in, in the uh, European referendum. Absolutely not Completely, true. yeah. Um, and it's yeah, it, and and most people who have a, a negative view about millennials don't include their own kids in that. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> but that's why I completely yeah. like to agree and say that yeah. you can't think outside the box until somebody's put you in it. Yeah, because you, we need to. We need to think. How many of us have got teenagers in the room that are doing things differently to us? Yeah. Yeah, we talked about it last night, didn't we, how, to, how different they are. Whether their, their education route determines how they work in the workforce or their mindset determines how they work in the workforce. And the rate of change is immense. And even Matt says himself, you know, he interacts now with people who are only seven or eight years younger than him who think completely differently to how he thinks. Because it's moving at a pace that we almost cannot keep up with. There is a point to all of this, by the way. So there is a key thread that runs through all of that. If you can read what it says there, our baby boomers and Generation X, they say, okay, well, we want to feel valued. We want to have a great customer experience when we're out there in the big wide world and we're interacting with whatever it might be, whether it's a, a dealer or a repair center or some uh, organization, whether we're buying stuff through a shop or whatever. But we want to feel valued and have a great experience. The guys in the middle, they want their customers to feel valued and receive a great experience because these are the ones who've been grow, who have grown up and been taught that customer experience and customer journey is everything and it's so important. And then we have our millennials as we're talk, talking about them now and they go, awesome, this tells me where I can get a great customer experience and feel valued. Now, the reason we challenged that video that said we need to have millennials adapt to working with us was that we look, first looked at that and went, no. I'm sorry, but the video was two 55-year-old men in a suit and tie stood in a, in, a, in a showroom, and that made me think, well, that's fine. That fits my model of the world. It's a million miles away from his model of the world and a billion miles away from the model of the world that the seven- or eight-year-old uh, younger uh, guys and girls that he interacts with see as well. Share with everyone your uh, young ex enterprise experiences recently. So I uh, don't know if you've heard of a charity called Young Enterprise. It's a charity based all over the UK. Uh, it encourages students of sixth form age, 
so 16, 17 and 18 year olds to set up a company during their school year. So they get a business advisor going once a week, help them set up a business. That could be a, a commerce business, an online business, an advice business, uh, a social enterprise business, however they want to do it, and they're supported all the way through the year. We then uh, do a Dragon's Den event, and we do a showcase event at the end of the year. Now, we are slightly discouraged by, and this is not a, a dig or anything like that, because I completely support them, but when we do a Dragon's Den event, we had one young people that was very entrepreneurial, that was very thinking outside the box, and we had a couple of people that sat there and saw his spark, saw his, his, his light behind his eyes, and sat there and went, well, we're going to have to find a box to put him in. To a 17-year-old young lad. Now, I did Young Enterprise 10 years ago, and I actually attribute that to why I'm stood here today. Right? But we as a business, if we don't listen to them, if we don't embrace them, and we don't accept them for what they want to bring to the table, we can't evolve. Because I bet when you were 17, 18, 19, and you went to your bosses and really, really, really wanted to have that voice to change some things in your business, did we? Or did you hold on to that, hold on to that breath and take it with you in your business? Steve said about that's how we were taught 20, 30 years ago. How many of us say in our business to, to new processes, to new methods, to new technology, that's not how we used to do it? How many of you have said that? I've been guilty of saying that's not how we used to do it. You said that? No, absolutely. But what we should be asking is how can we now do it? So much power in that. How can we now do it? How can we be ahead of the game? How can we be the best at what we do? So on that note, there's a way that we'd like to potentially give back to you of something that how can you understand your own behaviour, your own mindset, to help you be ahead of the game. So, again, this isn't a typology, it's not about stereotypes, it's not about putting anyone in a box, it's just about understanding a little tiny snippet of behaviours and personalities, because actually, not only is there an age element to it in terms of how we've adapted to the world, but there's also a behaviours and a behavioural preferences uh, way of uh, looking at this as well. And we work a lot with uh, behavioural profiling, so we'd like to give you a little snippet of that now. So if each of you could grab a bit of paper uh, and a pen or something to write on, uh, uh, something to write with uh, in front of you, that would be good, because this is quite participatory, is that the word? Don't ask me, I'm not school that day. <coughs> 20 minutes. So, it's not a typology, it's not about putting anyone in a box, but what we do is we start as a starting point of understanding behaviours, and this is important for understanding how behaviours evolve as well, because your preferences as they stand today will also link to how your preferences potentially will guide your thinking and your behaviours going forward as well. So we use something, I was mentioned earlier, I think if you were in this room you would have heard it mentioned, we use something called the DISC profiling system. Um, again, it's not about a, a scientific methodology or anything, well they'll say it is, but that's not what we're aiming at today. We just want to give you a little snippet of it just to kind of get you thinking that way a little bit really. And uh, what this bases us uh, all on is our natural set of behaviours, the behaviours that we've developed over our time to actually help us survive the world really. It also works on an adapted set of behaviours and we're not going to delve into that today. But what we've got is a very, very quick snippet of something just to give you a little bit of an insight and then I'm going to ask you to do a bit of work on it very quickly. So it's four styles. Sorry, come back. <laughs> See what now the apps happens when you don't use power. That's it. Uh, so we've got four styles. They are dominant and uh, influencer. We also have steadiness and we have compliant as well. We're going to explain a little bit more about what those mean. So we've got three sets of words for you, three sets of four words. As you see each set of word, what I'd, words, what I'd like you to do is to give yourself a score based on four, which is the word that's most like you, one, the word that's least like you, and a two and a three as well. Okay? So don't go just four, three, two, one. You, uh, you might find they'll jump about in order a little bit. So as you see the first set of words, which word is most like you, which word is least like you, and where would you put your two and a three in there as well? It's not just words, they're little phrases. So we've got use it, play with it, share it, and check it. So put a four 
next to the word that's most like you. And it should be spontaneous as well. It shouldn't be something you dwell about or think about um, unless you're very high compliant. We'll explore that in a minute. So it's a gut feel, instinct thing. Has everyone got a score for each of those words? You can only have one four, one two, one three, one one, and so on. You can't have a two fours, you can't. Sorry, what's most likely? Most yeah. four, four is, is most likely. likely. Four is most like you. One is least like you. So, everyone see that, right? So we've got use it, play with it, share it, check it. And the second set of words. Results. Inspiration, support, and systems. Number four for most like you, one for least like you. All good. And the final set of words is facts, that was facts, <laughs> possibilities, feelings, and logic. So, conscious of time, we were going to ask you to move around the room a little bit for this, and I think we'll just do this by a show of hands. So, has everyone got scores in each of those 12 boxes now? Yeah? So, as I said, it is a very, very quick and dirty uh, exercise. It's nowhere near as accurate as the full test would be, or even the little mini version that we use. Um, but, I mean, come and see us talk during the break or whatever, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you a bit more about that if it sparks your interest. This is just to give you a very, very quick snapshot idea. So... If you scored highly in the first column, so add up all your scores, sorry, I should have said. In that downwards, that is. So add up your scores for the, for the words on the left. <laughs> is that how you wrote them down? <laughs> okay, I'll give you a minute if you want to re reorder the words so that you can add them up. So we're adding them up vertically. Very, very quickly. So, of course, the maximum you would get in any one column would be 12. First one is D. First is So, did you have your highest score in the first column? Who had the highest? Quick show of hands. Who had the first highest score in the first column? Highest score. So, yeah. So, a high D, high dominance, will typically mean that you like to be described as a driver. You're very results driven, quite determined, and direct. Would that be fair? Yeah. Okay, there's a downside to these behaviours as well, and we'll explore all of that at the same time. Anyone give like hazard a guess what they think the downside of that set of behaviours is? Sorry? Not listening to other people. Dare I say, Paul, especially if they're 18 and they come across like they know everything. <laughs> yeah? So, not listening to other people. Sacrifice of people for tasks. Oh, tell me more about that. Sacrifice people for tasks. <laughs> As a benefit to the task. So people are, are there to facilitate a task getting done and then yeah, they're a means to an end. A means to an end. Right, okay, fantastic, good. Do you see where we're going, going with that? Yeah? Has anyone else got a comment on the high D? Right. Okay, so the next set of words. 
down the, next, the uh, second column. Who scored high in that area? Oh, quite a few high eyes. Two guys at the back of the room who I know very well are uh, trainers, consultants, uh, you know, facilitators and stuff. No surprise that they are high eyes because the behaviours that they described there could be expressive, optimistic, enthusiastic and outgoing. Just what you would expect for people to do what we do kind of comes with the territory. Yeah, fair to say? What's the downside of being a high eye? There are two. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. I missed that. Sorry. <laughs> Not high eye by any chance, Steve, eh? How bizarre. <laughs> so, over optimistic. Over optimistic, yeah. Over ah, interesting. Okay. You get disappointed easily. Get dis very dis di yeah, disappointed very easily. Yeah. And along with that, distracted even easier. Yeah? So, I've got, you've all got my full attention now. When somebody walks in there now with cupcakes, you've had it. <laughs> As you can, you know, clearly we saw that in the picture earlier. Okay, so we've got a few high eyes. High S's. That's the third column. That's high the third column. column. Third. Who's a high S? Oh, yeah. just a few. <laughs> Not Just a, a few high S's. Okay. All right. So high S behaviour typically is somebody who's described as sensitive. Uh, I don't know really, so, you know. Uh, patient, steady and caring, would you identify with that? Yeah. Those high S's, what's the downside of being a high S? You can be disappointed. You could be disappointed. By other people, yeah. People disappoint you. What else? People take advantage. Sorry? People can take advantage. People can take advantage of you, right. Okay. Yeah, because actually, if a high S comes up against someone who sees them as a means to an end, <laughs> right. Lots of what okay. Right. So that picture the scene. Go back a few slides. When Matt was talking about people who are less loyal, less attentive, right? I'm not sure what age group you put yourself in, Haley. I'm not going to ask. But you imagine again that we're generalising about people at a younger age range that come up against some of these type of behaviours. It begs the question, doesn't it, about how we manage them, how we develop them, how we grow them, how we even recruit them. Does that make sense? Big downside of high S is hesitance. From a car sales point of view, those of you that are involved in selling cars, a high S customer would typically say, what do you think? You tell me what you think. If you're a high D salesperson and you're just interested in the result and the outcome and the score on the board, that behaviour is going to do that. Probably you write your checkbook up. Sorry? <laughs> um, now, compliance. We hear the word compliance. How much do you hear the word compliance around the industry now? In a positive uh, connotation. Yeah. No one. <laughs> okay, so how many high C's did we have? How many people had a very high score in the final column? Half a dozen or so. So that's why we leave that till last, because they're probably sitting there trying to work it all out as we go along. We never ever start talking to the high C's first, because uh, they're trying to get their head around the process and how this all actually works. Could be described as an analyst. Accurate, conscientious, and logical. Would you say that was true? What's the downside of being a high C? Analysis paralysis. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Definitely. Again, that's how it's perceived by someone else. Yeah, okay. a bit of a job's work, a bit of a, you know, rules is rules. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Attention to detail. Attention to detail. You can't become a business without you successfully. Okay, so, you, so right, so there's a couple of points. Where is she? Exactly. There's a couple of points that come out of this, of what you've just touched on there, is actually, within a successful team, you need a mix of all of that. And you need to develop that as well. You need to help people also understand how do they adapt their skills. Because just because there's a few of us that are high eye and we like our energy and enthusiasm doesn't mean that we can't develop and adapt to be a high D or a high C if we have to. We want 90 second to two and a half minute short, sharp bursts. That's how they learn. It's Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Not sitting there wading through manual after manual while somebody who professes to be an expert stands up here 
and talks about all the stuff that happened 35 years ago. You all appreciate that. We've got two teenagers nodding vehemently. <laughs> Sorry? They are great. And it comes with a few challenges, I'm sure, but yeah. So just on that note, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I'd, I'd like to pick up on the fact that you're, you're nodding through the behaviours and, and, and what we notice. Let's consider what, what you know now, and let's consider going back into the workplace. So imagine your attitude in the workplace, you turning up in the morning, your attitude. Your attitude determines your behaviour. Would you agree? Yeah? yeah? So in, you're in a good attitude. This is, I do use it, I point out teenagers because... Having recently been one, I know that my attitude definitely determines my behaviour, especially focused towards my dad. Or <laughs> but would you then consider that your behaviour affects their attitude? And when I say their attitude, that could be your colleague's attitude, your customer's attitude. We used the word compliance a minute ago. If, when I was a salesman, I, was, I hate to admit this, but the compliance comes when you've got a customer that is showing a positive attitude. You can, you can have a better behaviour because of the impact that you're having on their attitude. But their attitude affects their behaviour. So if their attitude is quite negative, quite, I just want a price for my pie exchange, Dad, why are you telling me off, will affect their behaviour. Do you agree? But then that links to their behaviour is affecting your attitude. So where do you fit into that cycle? Where do you positively affect the next stage of the cycle? It could be at any point. But it's just being aware of that and being aware of where you can change something, where you can be more positive, where you can be more accepting of change will link to all of those stages in that cycle. A very quick example, we're working with a dealer group at the moment. We've been called in because they are falling foul of the FCA. Many of you will know that the FCA regulate the sale of finance and insurances, and they're falling foul of them because they've been pulled up on their culture. And what the FCA are concerned about is that how can you have somebody helping customers make an informed decision to buy certain products when you're running an incentive to win a Rolex watch in the weekend in Monaco? Now, I'm looking around the room, there's a few people going, yeah. and I'm thinking, well, yeah, actually, I've got probably got some stuff at home or in the loft that I've won on incentives similar to that. A few vouchers that I've had over the years. And back then that was fine. But these days it's a very different kettle of fish. And what we're working with them on is this stuff to say actually, you know, you need to really consider and seriously think about the behaviours that go into making up your culture. Because it's about asking the right questions and being adaptable <coughs> for whoever is sat in front of you, be they an employee or a customer. And that is just going to continue. So, I suppose our message really in terms of embracing evolution is to think about firstly understanding your behaviour. So we've done a little bit of a quick snapshot of the DISC profiling, which is the, the system that we use. Um, understand your behaviour. The premise of that is if you understand your behaviour, you can then start to understand other people's behaviours. And when you understand other people's behaviours, you're in a far stronger position to adapt and to flex and not do what this other person suggested, which is make other people adapt to fit with you. In the same time, we can start identifying customer habits because everything is changing. We all sit in rooms like this and we all agree, yeah, we do things a lot differently to the way we did it 10, 15, 20 years ago, and yet potentially, sometimes what we see is a lot of people who run their businesses in the same way they've always done it time and time and time. Matt and his wife and my other son uh, now sometimes say, Dad, we're not going to go out for dinner with you because you're a bloody embarrassment. We sit in Carluccio's and if the starters don't all arrive together or one main course is, is cold, I will moan about it. And I say, yeah, but the thing is, that's true, I will, because I'm less patient, I'm less tolerant, and I'm certainly less loyal than I was 20 years ago because there's so much more choice now and so many other things to get that I can take part in. My kids always want me to go with them because I'm Well, that as well, yeah, no, there is that. There's the trade off. But the point is, while he's complaining face to face, we've already sent a tweet on Twitter and got a 10% discount voucher. That's what the consideration is. I'm not saying we do that all the time. But. Or while I'm calling over the manager and having a word with them privately and telling them to have some, take some feedback, these guys are sitting there and going, on Facebook, where he's got 500 followers, going, Dad's kicking off again. 
what a novel. <laughs> or words to that effect. So I think that's just quoting an actual. <laughs> so you see how, you know, just as a very small example there, again, how things change. So here's a question for you, just literally, you know, think now or maybe jot down whatever first thing comes into your head. How are you currently evolving your approach? What do you need to do to evolve your approach? We heard some fantastic stuff from Steve this morning about the way things are going. Electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, all this stuff that's just, you know, our heads are spinning with the speed at which stuff is changing and what's actually happening. You know, if you were in here this morning, you heard about gaining and retaining staff and motivating them from Carl. And, you know, there's some fantastic things there about what do we need to do to engage our, our employees and, and get our teams all on the same page. But a key part of that is ourselves. And I would urge you, on the way out the door, there's a few mirrors around. If you do need to take a quick look in the mirror and ask yourself that question, please do. Yeah. So, we like a bit of Henry Ford. So one of those questions can be, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Thank you. <laughs>